Hi, and welcome to the DNA Discussions. My daughter Haven, she just turned a year old, and it's been amazing over the course of this last 12 months to watch her go from a lovable lump in my arms, a baby who could not talk and could not eat, transform into kind of a waddling toddler who's able to form some really basic words and chew some really soft foods with just a couple teeth. The thing that's really amazed me about it is realizing that from the very time that her body was being formed in the womb, that there was this self-replicating material in each cell contained her DNA. It's determined the way that she's grown. It has formed her into who she is as a one-year-old and will continue to form her even into her mid-30s or her 60s, 70s, 80s and beyond. These traits, these characteristics, this DNA has been with her from the very beginning. And in the same way, in the early stages of our church life together, we have had building blocks and foundations and core principles that have been laid. Over these last 18 months, we've explored them, but we want to bring them into a further clarity here. These values, this DNA, you will find that we want them to be embedded into the life of each disciple made within our church. That we want each of our house churches to use these values to grow and mature. So I hope that you enjoy these panel conversations, these DNA discussions. Welcome to the uh, Thomas living room. So David, thanks for opening up your home for this. It feels very uh, glamorous to have <laughs> filming going on in our living room. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And I just felt natural to ask the two of you to be in this discussion. We're going to have different voices in for the following four weeks. But really from the start of the call that Maddie and I felt to plant arise, David, you were in at the ground level with that because you were just wrestling through life and calling with us and have been faithful to journey with us in that. And from the start, we said we want to have a community that is about awakening. We didn't want to have a network of house churches that were a reaction against something, but rather a community of house churches that were about awakening the world to the reality of Jesus. And, mm -hmm. you know, you have your PhD in the role of prayer in the history of great awakenings. And would you give us just a snapshot uh, mm -hmm. view of, you know, what that means when we talk about awakening the world to the reality of Jesus? Yeah. Sure, you know, awakening is kind of an old-fashioned word, and um, we don't think of it and use it all that much, but it is a, it's a great word and that Arise has sort of taken on, and I really appreciate that you all launched the church with that commitment because awakening is, is not just some broad sociological, historical kind of reality. It is embedded in real time, real place, and real relationships. Mm -hmm. That's why it, it moves, awakening moves in colonies of love, colonies of awakening. I think of Arise as being just this full-on embodiment of, of, of the life of the kingdom of God. I don't think there's a better way to think of awakening than just to be in a community of people that are after being an answer to the Jesus, the prayer Jesus gave us, that the kingdom would come on earth as it is in heaven, simply put. Mm -hmm. Another way of thinking about awakening is that it's kind of really the story of the church. I mean, I think one of the great ways to understand the whole sweeping story of the Christian movement since Pentecost is as a series of awakenings. Those, those times and places when the Spirit has breathed new life into the work of Jesus in the earth. I, I just treasure the fact that Arise just has ordered itself. We are just framing our reality. We, want, we don't want just a growing church, a good church, a well-produced church. We want a supernatural church. We have to have a church where people are encountering the living God. And so... I guess from the big, broad picture, historical, biblical picture, that's just sort of what we're after. We're just wanting to, to really be an answer to what Jesus taught us to pray for. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which is for the kingdom to come on earth as, as it is in heaven. Mm -hmm. yeah. And awakening, what would you say would be the sign of awakening in our society today? Like if awakening were to happen, yeah. what would be the key sign of that? 
the absolute epicenter of awakening is encounter with Jesus. Mm -hmm. Not knowing more about him, not being involved in things that connect to him, mm -hmm. but just full face on mm -hmm. being arrested right in the direct path of my life. I have met the living God. Yeah. I have seen the face of Jesus and the Spirit of God has poured His love into my life. It's unmistakable. And uh, that, that experience of, of the ministry of the Holy Spirit to, to give, give us the love of God, you know, the Spirit indwells us to create in us the character of Jesus, the fruit of the Holy Spirit, and to, through us, continue the ministry of Jesus, yeah. the, the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And when, when that is... When those, those dimensions of the ministry of the Spirit are being embodied in the life of a community, that really is kind of the, the core element of an awakening movement. And when that happens in a heart, mm -hmm. and it becomes experienced in a household of love, single friends or married friends or families coming together, and that's experienced in, this, in the core relationships of our lives, and those come together into a church yeah. and finds expression there. And then those, if there can be a city with a few of those churches happening, yeah. that's enough for a city to experience awakening. I love, I love what you just said, David, because so often when you hear the manifestations of awakening, it can feel like a burden. People are like, mm. how do we do all of these things? But that's the thing is what you just said is the epicenter of awakening, the beginning of awakening, is encounter with Jesus, authentic encounter with Jesus yeah. that changes you, that changes you, your little pocket, your community, your church, your city. But that it's not, oh, we have to now strategize the right. manifestation of awakening, which is very different, you know? Like, I even so, think yeah. that there's, at times, a mentality around awakened communities that are like, Let's just start doing all these things yeah. that are what awakening looks like. But I think really the only thing we need to be doing that you're saying is being in the presence of God Just and being changed by him, you know, yeah. praying, waiting, um, anticipating and expecting that he wants to encounter us, that he mm. wants to be um, us be known by him and him be known by us. So yeah. I don't know. I just love what That's you're so... saying. And I think it's it, when you really understand that, um, it is disarming because any yeah. sort of um, preconceived notions of the some sort of burden of making this happen is released because yes. you're like, oh, so what it looks like for me to become an awakened person and then for our community to be awakened and our city to be awakened is for me to encounter Jesus, you know, and then for me and my friends yeah. to encounter Jesus. Oh, well, that's so good, Maddie, because awakening, when we think about it as society level, can feel, we can see the need. Like wow, we need to we need God to come and move beyond our own power and our own ability, yeah. and that can feel so overwhelming, mm -hmm. and it can even feel almost like crazy or a little insane for <laughs> you know a network of house churches to say we want to be about this great awakening. We yeah. want to, but really what it is is it's, it's a statement to say uh, we want to be about faith that God can move in the world today. And that doesn't create anxiety within us. It doesn't create fear. Um, but what it, it does when we, you know, we say we value awakening within our house churches and within our own lives is uh, the response of a person who wants to be awakened to the power of God is not anxiety, it's not fear, but it's actually, it's surrender. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that, yeah. that we're surrendered to what God would want to do in our lives. And for people who have experienced God in moments of personal awakening throughout Scripture, that is what I think we, we see. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think about Peter when he first meets Jesus in Luke 5. And he's, he's in his fisherman's boat, and Jesus is just passing through. So Peter had maybe heard of Jesus, but had never seen him before. And Jesus says, Peter, I want to get in your boat, and I want to teach from your boat. So Peter had been fishing all night, welcomes Jesus into his boat. Jesus preaches to the masses, and then he looks at Peter and says, Okay, Peter, cast out your net to catch fish. And, and Peter says, You know, I've been fishing all night, but I haven't caught any fish. And Jesus, you know, says, well, go ahead and cast one more time. And he does. And of course, the haul of fish is massive. It's enormous. 
And Peter, when he realizes who Jesus is in that moment, his response is, depart from me, Lord, for I am a sinful person. But, but that is, and Jesus, of course, doesn't reject Peter, but he welcomes him in to be uh, the closest to him, of, potentially of his disciples. Mm-hmm. And that's the experience of someone who doesn't just know God as a philosophy or a theology, mm-hmm. who, doesn't, who knows Christianity beyond morality, but actually knows Jesus, is an encounter with the presence of God, an encounter with the love of God, where we respond in surrender and repentance. Mm -hmm. And what we do is we receive blessing in that moment to live a new life, to live in relationship with God, to live in the presence of God, to live in an awareness, a fresh awareness of who Jesus is. And it's that person, that surrendered person, who can be used for awakening. And when we say we value you know, being awakened to the reality of Jesus at a personal level. Mm -hmm. It is a life of surrender and a life of knowing God and living in the presence of God. Mm -hmm. And Maddie, I was just, I'm curious if you wouldn't mind sharing one or two maybe moments of your life Mm -hmm. where you felt like you've been made aware of the presence of God in a fresh way. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think for me, um, awakening, even as we're talking, I've just felt like um, I've had a series of awakenings in my Mm -hmm. life. You know, Mm -hmm. there's been moments of um, encounter with Jesus that that transformed me beyond my ability or power and then set me on mission. And then I saw the outward effects of it. So that was personal awakening. Obviously, that wasn't um, necessarily, you know, corporate or citywide, but, um, but, but a series of awakenings in my life and that he is constantly drawing me back through these cycles of awakening in my own spirit. Um, but I think, you know, it started for me when I was 17, you know, a lot of people know my story of awakening, but just had a radical encounter with Jesus when I was 17, writing an English essay. Um, totally changed my life. I was living just in total darkness, truly even probably had some oppression going on in my life, deep oppression and woundedness and, um, decisions and, you know, had a radical encounter with Jesus writing an English essay and, and felt, um, his, his physical presence on me and heard him say that he, that he was the answer like that I had been looking for, um, immediately had, um, that encounter immediately broke off a lot of bondage in my life. And I just went, I mean, all in with Jesus. I was, I went from being the girl who thought it was crazy to like front row at everything, Mm -hmm. looking for mentors, seeking, 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 and, and really finding him there. Um, so that was when I was 17. And then fast forward to college, um, another season of brokenness as I, I had been walking through healing through all of that, um, like kind of past stuff and in a season of healing, uh, really in the most, probably one of the most dramatic ways in my life over a period of like about three months, it was, it was travail. I had entered into a spirit of travail and desperation for God because I was like, I love you, Jesus, and I still see that I can't do this on my own, and I still see that I'm a broken, unhealed, um, not whole person, and I need your healing, and I need you to come and transform me, and entered into a season of travail for a few months that really led to one of the most massive uh, fillings of the Spirit in my life, Um, just you know, no one was there to teach me theologically what this even was to mean or look like, Mm -hmm. but I started having dreams, like God giving me really profound prophetic dreams. I started, um, sensing or hearing things in my heart that I thought were for other people. And then when I tested it or asked people in a loving way, like, what's going on? Is this something that's like going on with you? Can I encourage you here? You know, tears would come and just the spirit was pouring out in my life and I was, I was encountering mm-hmm. Jesus, um, day after day after day and, and healing was happening. Yeah. So it was like healing transformation, um, outpouring of the spirit, like so much happening just in this little window 
of time. And then even a really cool part of that is God just supernaturally leading me to a community of people who were then doing this, um, who taught me the way and really, um, just brought a lot of theological understanding and girding under what was my personal experience. Um, which then some of you guys know, but led to, um, night watch, which was this, uh, as God was doing all this and just showing me uh, maybe who I was in God and awakening this passion and need for awakening. And I was just on fire to see everybody encounter Jesus the way I had been encountering him. Uh, birthed a worship and prayer night that went through the night in college and um, just saw like profound moves of the spirit there. Um, and yeah. it's spirit of prayer and worship that was poured out over a community and the presence of God. So and then, I mean, from there, on and on it goes, you know, seasons yeah. of anxiety where God uh, brought me to my knees and desperation and travail and then met me there and encounter and transformed my life. And then an outflow from that, like seeing so many people when I was in college ministry who I was able to minister from a place of, of power, you know, yeah. that I had experienced with God and see people get freed of anxiety and depression and panic disorders and, you know, just... It, it wow. is just a series of yeah. personal awakenings and a trajectory. Yeah, yeah, an unfolding of awakenings in our lives yeah. when it looks personal and when you're really seeking and desiring to just be um, yeah. a vessel and to say, like, to be aware of your need um, and to really s- submit to him in prayer to become a prayerful person. I feel like my life yeah. has just been a, an outer working of a series of awakenings yeah. and transformation and missional movements. Um out of my encounter with him so Mm -hmm. that's so good maddie thanks for sharing your experiences and you know your life and the way that you've modeled that surrender in different times Mm -hmm. and i'm lucky to get an up close and personal Mm -hmm. view of that Mm -hmm. you know and i'm so appreciative of the way that that god's moved in your life and the way that you've responded as well Mm -hmm. and again with this value this is a driving reason why we do house church It's because we really want to be about the simplicity of presence, Mm -hmm. the simplicity of the presence of one another, and also the presence of God. Mm -hmm. And David, I'm wondering if you would help us understand how we can pray within our house churches, um, what the role of prayer can be in our relationships with one another, that when we gather, it wouldn't just be about the presence of one another, where it's so important, but where we could actually maybe contend and welcome and usher in the presence and the love of Jesus Mm -hmm. on each other's behalf, and then also contend for that for our families and for the world around us. Yeah, Austin, I really appreciate that question because it does, all of this um, makes its way back to prayer. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, all these things that we're talking about in history, in scripture, in experience, it finds its way back to the place of encounter. Yeah. The very essence is encounter, and that is a place of prayer. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, there's a lot we need to do to follow God into this journey, but there's nothing that we do until we pray. Mm-hmm. It's first. And um, in the house church, prayer is, is so essential because. It really is the way in which we together seek the presence of God to to take moments where we do wait on Him. We we just intentionally slow down and let's just give a moment to the Spirit to speak. Let's just be quiet for a second and invite Him and wait on Him. Because if we do, He's sure to come. This is the one thing we never have to wonder about. When we pray that ancient prayer of the church, come Holy Spirit, we never have to wonder Does he want to? Will he? You know, this, we never have to wonder, is that the will of God? Can we ask that? Always. God is communicative. He desires to make himself known. He desires to, he is always speaking. I think one of the best things that we can do in in our house churches is just to pray that continually for a baptism of the voice of God. Yeah. More of the voice of God. And uh, this, we're after spirit-assisted prayer. That's prophetic prayer. That, you know, it's just spirit-assisted. That we're not just sort of coming up with the stuff to talk to God about. Right. It's like, no, He's speaking to us. He's helping yeah. us. He's authoring prayer. Mm-hmm. We give it utterance, mm-hmm. add faith to it, and our unity to it, and we'll watch God work. Yeah. And so, yeah, if we can take time and do what you were just saying, Maddie, just take the yeah. risk. You know, I kind of would like to pray for you in this mm-hmm. way. I don't know if that's on target or not. It, it, 
And it may be, mm -hmm. if it's not, no one got hurt, right. you know, <laughs> nothing lost. But yeah. it may be yeah. that that's just exactly what God yeah. wants to do in someone's life, to, to experiment. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. We often talk about having an experimental attitude in prayer. It's like, can, give it a try. Can we right. just try this? And, um, you know, we do that with wisdom and, you know, staying in, in step with Scripture. Yes. But to just ex give things to, you know, not anything's going to happen unless we're willing to take a risk right. and try. Right. Yeah. And just to be experimental. Mm -hmm. And so I'm so grateful for ways in which any opportunity a house church mm -hmm. takes to break out of routine prayer casual prayer mm -hmm. into something that is a little slightly more non-casual yeah. and a little bit more experimental and a little bit more dependent on God yeah. really relying on him that's an awakening move yeah. that's taking a little inch toward more yeah. of what we're after mm -hmm. here and then the last thing I would say about that is we minister to one another this is how God ministers mm -hmm. to us is through through the life of prayer you know exhibited in the in a body but then, that's prayer in the church. But then there's the prayer of the church. Mm. And that's we say, okay, now we're going to go shoulder to shoulder. And we are going to go after an outpouring of God in this yeah. city. Mm -hmm. We're going to contend for Lexington. Or we're going to contend for this school in our neighborhood. Yeah. We're going to contend for this street. We're going to prayer walk our cul-de-sac. We're going to yeah. say, God, in my time and in my place, come and move. Mm -hmm. Come and do it. And uh, man, when... When God's people get after it like that with humility and repentance and, yeah. and, uh, and passion and desire, that's where the scriptures and all of history prove. And all around the world today, that's when God moves. Hi, my name is Allie Strandmark, and I'm part of the Greer Gullet House Church at Arise. And we started coming in at the beginning of October, but in November was the first time I'd really ever heard about awakening. So David Thomas talked about awakening and honestly it seemed really lofty to me, like unachievable even for me. Kind of impossible, like he was talking about these huge 24 seven prayer and preaching movements. And I was just like, whoa, do these people have jobs? Do they have kids? Um, they have to like keep alive and you know it just seemed like a lot and I at the time was just feeling so exhausted and tired with my own to-do list of like wanting to be a good mom and a good wife and a good friend and daughter and worker, co-worker, everything. So it seemed like a lot but then David Thomas said one thing that sparked a little hope he said it starts here and it starts here and it starts here with just you and the people you're around. So I like breathed a deep breath after that and that was good. And then the next week, Austin came to our house church to talk about awakening. And um, he said two things that stuck out to me. He said, awakening requires a posture of repentance. And I thought, okay, I could do that. I can like be aware of my sins and you know want to turn from them and ask forgiveness and um, turn towards God. That, that is something I'm good, I got sense, I can do that. And the second thing he said was he was talking about like your heart motivation, being compelled by God's love to act rather than being compelled by what you could gain from your actions. And I was like, oh shoot, because it just hit me. Probably for the first time, it really hit me um, that I was definitely you know, the second. I grew up in the church and I grew up loving God and I grew up wanting God to love me. And I also just always had this desire to do what is right. But I realized that my motivation for doing what is right was not sustainable. I was compelled by what I could gain, like approval, status, worth, or, and love. You know, I think all of those really are wrapped up in love. I just was trying to get love. And I was a big people pleaser. Like I um, especially wanted to please people who loved God because then maybe it would please God. And I wanted to please God so that he would like me and so that he would love me more so I'd be good enough.
so that I'd be good enough for him. And I felt like I had to work for it and to earn his love. I felt like I had to literally be worth Jesus dying on the cross for me. Then Sarah Faye asked us, you know, does hearing all this encourage you or does it discourage you? I didn't even realize before, but I, I don't think I could fully accept God's love for me. And I don't think I could fully accept his forgiveness for me. I, and I, I remember saying the word stuck to them. I felt stuck that I had to work for God's love in, instead of working from God's love. That was definitely just not what I had been doing or what I even thought I could do. And I said that to everyone, the whole house church. Um, I just like confessed it and said, this is where I'm at. They prayed for me. As they were praying, it really felt like they were lifting me up to the Father so that I would know His love for me, that they were lifting me up to Jesus so that I would know His grace that covers me, and that they were lifting me up to the Holy Spirit, that He would move or remove what was in my heart that was blocking me being able to receive God's love for me. And I remember um, Maddie Wofford, one of the things she prayed, she was talking about and she just saw like pages of a journal, of a journal that were filled with whatever I had done or what anyone had done to me that I was holding on to that was keeping me from God. And that they were just being, she saw them just being ripped away, just page by page ripped away and just gone. Um, and prayed that I would feel that, like know that in my heart that um, that's what forgiveness is. It felt like that through that confession um, and admission to my community, like that a weight was lifted. Just by recognizing what was going on in my heart and saying it out loud to them. But you know, it did feel like that weight was lifted just by confessing and, and saying it to, to my people. So then I, um, I woke up early on Monday morning because I had decided that I, I wanted to spend time with God. I had not done that in years. I remember just sitting in my chair, I was about to you know, open my Bible to read it, and I remember just feeling surrounded by the fullness of God's love for me. And I don't know how to explain it because it was nothing happening. It was just in my heart, it felt full of God's love for me. And I was by myself in a room early in the morning and I had this huge smile come on my face. Like I was just smiling, sitting in my chair, resting in God's love. That's all what I was doing. I was doing nothing else, which is meaningful to me because I wasn't doing anything to earn it. I wasn't trying to actively earn or work for His love. I was just resting in it. And it was just already there, you know, surrounding me and filling me. For the first time in years, I felt like the gap between God and me was gone, that I was um, free from holding on to anything in the past. And it really felt like that the prayer of the journal pages being floated away, you know, that's what it felt like. You know, I know who I am now because I know who God is and what He's done for me and how He loves me. Yeah, in Romans 5, 8 it says, but God demonstrates His own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While I was still not holy, not perfect, not righteous, is when God sent Christ to us to die for us because He loved me already. And I just, you know, learning that we were created for love and in love and by love and because of love. Um, and that love came first, and it, it doesn't come after we do something or say something or be something. Um, yeah. Uh, God loves us and He wants to be with us. And uh, 
because he loves us, he made a way for us to be with him through Jesus. And, um, oh, I wanted to read a verse, but my Bible's over there. Romans 3, 21 through 24. But now a righteousness from God, apart from law, has been made known, to which, to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. And I was forgetting the and. Um, I was stopping for all those years at for all fall short. <laughs> for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But there's a next verse. There's a and um, are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. So thank you, Jesus. <laughs> That's all. <laughs>